the fact that enthalpy is a state function gives us some pretty powerful conceptual and quantitative tools for determining enthalpy values without running experiments or even interpreting experimental data. To begin to get a feel for this, I want to return to our example of state functions in the context of climbing a mountain. We looked at climbing Mount Kilimanjaro and state functions associated with that in an earlier video on state and path functions, and I would want to return there now. Say I wanted to know the height difference between Mount Kilimanjaro and Mount Everest. Let's call that delta little h between these two mountains. I could determine that a few different ways. If I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro and I knew the height of this mountain, let's call it h sub k, and then I went down Mount Kilimanjaro, walked over to Mount Everest, and I climbed Mount Everest, and I knew the height here, h sub e, well then the difference in height between these two mountains is simply the height of Mount Everest minus the height of Mount Kilimanjaro. So one way to approach this is to climb to the top of one mountain and then record my elevation as I go from the top of Kilimanjaro down to the bottom. There's negative hk, walk over to Mount Everest, and walk up Mount Everest, and there's positive he. That's one way to go about doing this. Of course, another way to go about doing it is to simply fly from the top of Mount Kilimanjaro to the top of Mount Everest in a helicopter, airplane, whatever, recording my elevation as I do that. And this is another way to determine the change in height. Say I go from a height of H1 at the top of Kilimanjaro to a height H2 at the top of Everest, we might write that as H2 minus H1. As a third way of doing this, without climbing any mountains, if I went and looked up the height of Mount Kilimanjaro and looked up the height of Mount Everest, I could determine the height differential by subtracting that h sub e, which I looked up, from h sub k, which I also looked up. So if someone else has climbed these mountains already and recorded their heights, there's no need for me to climb any mountains at all. It's key, though, however, that the process of recording the heights is standardized for both mountains. In other words, they're from a common point of reference, right? Sea level or some other common point of reference has to be the standard for both mountains, otherwise the heights are not directly comparable. A similar problem exists for enthalpies, and a similar advantage exists if we establish a standard baseline of enthalpies and work from there to determine the enthalpies of chemical reactions. We can kind of stand on the shoulders of giants, if you will, rely on the measurements of others as long as all of those prior measurements were made using a standard kind of baseline of enthalpy. In this video, we're going to define that standard baseline of enthalpy, which is the enthalpies of the elements in their standard states, and determine a standard way of measuring the enthalpy of a substance called enthalpy of formation for a standardized reaction that is, has been conventionally determined to be the formation of the compound from its elements. And eventually we'll get to a point where we can use enthalpies of formation that are known to calculate the enthalpy of any reaction involving substances whose enthalpies of formation are known. Very powerful stuff because we don't need to run any chemical reactions to calculate those. We rely on past measurements, the measurements of others, and use some pretty straightforward math associated with the idea that enthalpy is a state function, extremely analogous to what we looked at in the Kilimanjaro and Everest examples, to calculate enthalpies of reaction. When we measure the height of a mountain, like Mount Everest or Mount Kilimanjaro, we do that starting from a standard baseline, sea level, which is our zero of height, and following a standard process to reach the summit. Similarly, in chemistry, we start with a baseline enthalpy value and use a standard process to measure the standard enthalpy of a compound. That baseline of zero enthalpy are the enthalpies of the elements in their natural forms at standard state. And the standard process we follow is called a formation reaction. And formation reactions are defined very precisely. A formation reaction is specifically the generation of one mole of a compound in a given phase, so different phases correspond to different formation reactions from the reactants which are the natural forms of the elements in their standard state for a standard formation reaction. And this formation process has an enthalpy associated with it that we call the standard enthalpy of formation. But before we get to that, let's look at some examples 
of formation reactions. So for example, the formation of carbon dioxide gas, CO2 gas, is specifically the reaction of elemental carbon, solid carbon at the standard state, with elemental oxygen, which is O2 gas at standard state, to form one mole of CO2. So there's one mole of the compound on the right-hand side, and the elemental forms of the atoms that make up that compound on the left-hand side. And we make the stoichiometry work out so that we generate one mole of the compound on the right-hand side. So for example, for lithium oxide, which is Li2O in the solid state, the formation reaction involves two moles of lithium solid, elemental lithium, half a mole of elemental oxygen, since we only need one oxygen to form one mole of Li2O, generating Li2O solid, a single mole of that as the product. As one last example, liquid octane or isooctane, C8H18 liquid. The formation reaction for this substance involves the combination of eight moles of elemental carbon with nine moles of elemental hydrogen, H2, in the gaseous state to form C8H18 in the liquid state. So these are three examples of formation reactions. And the idea is you may be asked to start here with the compound and write a formation reaction for that compound in that specific state by taking the compound and breaking it up into its constituent elements, carbon and oxygen, lithium and oxygen, carbon and hydrogen, etc. This is a skill you're definitely going to need to succeed at chemical thermodynamics. Now, each of these reactions has an enthalpy associated with it. The enthalpy change associated with each of these reactions is what's known as an enthalpy of formation. And if we're saying the reactants and products are in their standard states, the result is a standard enthalpy of formation. And we can attribute this to the product, to the compound on the right-hand side. So for example, we can talk about the enthalpy of formation of carbon dioxide gas, which is the enthalpy change associated with this reaction in occurring in the standard state. Likewise for the other two substances, and do note that enthalpy of formation is state or phase dependent. So for example, the enthalpy of formation of solid carbon dioxide, CO2 solid, is very different from the enthalpy of formation of carbon dioxide gas. Now in terms of a baseline, we assume that for the elements in their standard states, in other words, for the substances on the left-hand side of these formation reactions, the enthalpy of formation is zero. And this is a, an assumption or a definition that we use as our baseline, right? This is sea level for the enthalpies of chemical substances. The enthalpy of formation for an element is zero by definition. And in some sense, if we try to write the formation reaction of an element, this becomes immediately apparent. If I'm trying to form carbon solid, for example, from the corresponding elements, well, the overall chemical equation is just going to be carbon solid going to carbon solid. And very clearly, because absolutely nothing has changed, the delta H for this process under standard conditions or any conditions is going to be zero. Let's practice now writing some formation reactions given a compound and its state. So the first is C2H5OH. The way I like to go about doing this is to first write on the right-hand side of the equation the given compound, since we know that's going to be the product. And we need to make one mole of that substance, again, by convention, since the standard formation reaction involves formation of one mole of the given substance in the given phase. Then I look at the elements inside the given compound and the number of atoms of each type of element contained within. We've got carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in this compound. So I know I'm going to need carbon in its elemental form, which is carbon solid. I'm going to need hydrogen in its elemental form, which is H2 gas. And I'm going to need oxygen in its elemental form, which is O2 gas. So I'm not worrying about stoichiometry just yet only the substances contained within this compound, only the elements contained within and their forms. Now I look at the stoichiometric coefficients and this is gonna guide my thinking on, now I look at the subscripts in the formula of the compound and this is gonna guide my thinking on the stoichiometric coefficients on the left-hand side. So I've got two carbons, five plus one hydrogens, six hydrogens total, 
and one oxygen in this compound. And I just use stoichiometry to deduce what the coefficients must be from this. So I need two carbons. I've got one carbon right here. I need to add a two in front of it to balance out carbon. I've got six hydrogens on the right-hand side. I've only got two on the left-hand side, so I'm going to need three H2 molecules or three moles of H2 on the left-hand side. I've got one oxygen on the right-hand side and two on the left-hand side, so I only need half a mole or half a molecule, quote-unquote, of O2 to balance things out on the right-hand side. So these stoichiometric coefficients come from the subscripts in the compound as given. In the second case, we have calcium phosphate, Ca3PO42, in the solid state, and we're going to proceed analogously. So I'm going to start by writing calcium phosphate on the right-hand side in the given state, which is solid. And I'm going to look for the elements contained within this compound. I've got calcium, phosphorus, and oxygen. First, I'm going to write the elements in their natural forms at standard state. We've got calcium metal which is simply calcium solid. We've got phosphorus, which in its natural elemental form exists as P4 in the solid state. And we've got oxygen, which as we saw above, exists in the gaseous state as O2 here. So now we're going to zero in on the subscripts in the given formula of the compound. And we're going to use those to deduce the stoichiometric coefficients here on the left-hand side. So we start with calcium. There are three calciums inside one mole of this compound, three moles of calcium, so I need three moles of calcium on the left-hand side as well. For phosphorus, we've got two phosphorus atoms inside the compound since PO4 is multiplied by two. So I need half a mole of P4 to supply the two moles of phosphorus needed in the compound on the right-hand side. And for oxygen, I've got eight oxygens in the calcium phosphate compound, four inside the phosphate anion times two. And so I need four molecules of O2 to ensure that oxygen is balanced on the left-hand side. So here's the formation reaction for calcium phosphate solid. And because we're going to make use of these values later, note that the enthalpy change associated with these processes occurring in the standard state is the enthalpy of formation of the compound that appears on the right-hand side. So the enthalpy change of this first reaction is the enthalpy of formation of C2H5OH, specifically in the liquid state. And the enthalpy change for this bottom reaction is the enthalpy of formation of calcium phosphate, specifically in the solid state. 